The uh, Connecticut State College and University Board of Regents, a unanimous vote uh, was had, held back in June of 2021 to rename the science building on the campus of Eastern Connecticut State University uh, as the Dr. David G. Carter Science Building. And so we will now, henceforth and forevermore, become to know the science building as the Dr. David G. Carter Science Building. And off. here's what we have. Yay. Without a doubt, uh, you know, the legacy of Dr. Carter uh, certainly uh, has withstood the, the test of time. The current uh, president, uh, Dr. Elsa Nunez. The science building is an excellent symbol of our commitment to teaching science to young children across the state of Connecticut. The science building also features modern labs that include a host of state-of-the-art equipment, uh, microscopes, a virtual dis dissection table, and much more. The building has many green energy efficiencies, and after it opened, the science building gained the Silver LEED certification from the United States Green Building Council. Dr. Carter was a genius, and if I had a lot of time, I could give you the list of things he did, but I just want to name two. The first was, today, climate change and issues of state sustainability, those things are vogue. Everybody's talking about them. He started that 20 years ago, over 20 years ago. He was a visionary, a genius. He started the Institute for Sustainability hired a very effective man named Bill Leahy, and the Institute became instantly uh, widely known in um, the state of Connecticut. He saw things before other people did. His second genius, people talk about he was a wonderful president of Eastern, but he was a wonderful chancellor for the entire system. And the other three state college presidents talk about Dr. Carter's genius. So in the old days, for us to get a new building, the legislature would appropriate the money, but then the bond commission had to release it. So where the politics got really tough was that we would get the money and then they would never release it. So this frustrated, of course, the presidents, but it often frustrated Dr. Carter beyond compare because he knew that we needed these buildings, buildings desperately to compete with UConn and the likes of the other private institutions, and he was competitive. So what he did was he came up with a strategy and went to the legislature and got a bill passed that allowed for 10 years of money. It wasn't a lot more money because that wasn't the genius. He locked in 10 years of the money every year with one commission meeting. So the commission met, it released all the money at once, which meant that for 10 years we could build, never having to go back to the uh, Bond Commission. He was a genius. No one had ever thought of that. Uh, but of course, uh, behind many great men, uh, there's a great family. And uh, we are very honored to have uh, one of his daughters uh, here with us today. And so uh, without further ado, I would like to ask uh, his daughter, uh, Jessica Carter, uh, to come. And she will not only provide us with an invocation, uh, but will also provide a few remarks on behalf of the family. Uh, Jessica. So now I will put on my other hat and bring you greetings from our family. First, we would like to thank the committee, Dr. Nunez, um, the Connecticut State University system, the entire university family, Dwight Bachman, and friends and supporters. Most of our family lives out of state, and with COVID and during these times, um, most are not able to attend today's ceremony in person, so they're watching on the live stream. But I wanted to make sure that I took a few moments to share some reflections about my father. Most of you know dad's backstory. Some of you may not. You'll learn a little bit here. My father was the youngest son of my paternal grandfather, Richard Walter Carter, and his wife, Esther. My dad had four brothers, all older than him. But my father was the son of his father's old age. My father was born uh, when my grandfather was quite old. And when my dad was still a child, a devastating, life-changing event occurred. As I understand it, my grandfather owned a small general store um, in Dayton, Ohio. He didn't trust banks with money, so he kept the money in their house. 
One terrible night, the entire house burned down, taking everything they owned. Um, my dad's father later died of complications from that fire. His mother was seriously injured, saving my dad from the fire. Can you imagine what his life was like after that? My dad's right hand was burned so severely that he had to learn to write with his left hand. Many of you who knew him could see the scars and the burns on his hand. He had skin grafts multiple times. This began a very difficult stage of life for him. But education helped him during this period. I hope these following vignettes that I share, just a few, to keep within my five minute timeline, <laughs> um, these few vignettes I think will help you understand how education illuminated the path of my father's life. Um, at least from these stories, partly, you'll be able to see how he grew into the person that he would eventually become. Among the most influential instruction my father received came from his mother and aunts. My father and his brothers would get into trouble, as was often the case, five young men. His mother would wait until he was sleeping in the middle of the night and wake him up for some instruction. <laughs> for an hour or more, she would sit and talk with him about the need for changing his behavior, the need for improvement, what it meant to grow up as a young man. He and his brothers hated this form of discipline intensely. Naturally, it was very successful at corralling all of their tempers. Outside of the home, other influences arose. The Everett sisters were two women that taught in Dayton, uh, the Dayton public school system. They noticed dad was a bright young man and took it upon themselves to invest in his education and his life. They provided strict guidance, care, and high expectations for a young man who very much needed it at that time. I asked him once whether he invited the Everett sisters to his college graduation. And dad looked at me with a sly smile, and he said, I invited them to my PhD graduation. Even then, as a young man, I think he knew that he was destined for greater things, but he never forgot the people who helped him. This later spurred him to use education as a tool to help others. It would be wonderful if all the stories of dad's education were as positive as the Everett sisters' story. But a negative event also influenced him. When he was in elementary school, he wrote a short story, nothing particularly special. But a certain teacher decided that he lacked the intelligence to write that story and accused him of plagiarism. He was cleared, but he learned early that appearing too intelligent could be perceived as threatening to others. So he made a habit of keeping a low profile. By the time people realized the depth of his intelligence, it was too late to stop him. <laughs> a third and final story is from my father's college days. He had a very tough, uh, a professor that was a very tough grader. Before class began, the professor told him and the other students his philosophy. I'm paraphrasing. The author of the textbook gets an A. The professor gets a B. The best students can get is a C. This professor was of Chinese American heritage and he had a significant influence on my father's educational pursuits. My dad was determined to do well in that class, working even harder than usual, which, if you know my dad, is really saying something. Eventually, dad received a B in that class. He was so proud of his work that he was able to demonstrate mastery of the subject matter that even a professor with such high standards approved of his work. In closing, education provided numerous opportunities for dad. He grew as a person and as an educator, always wanting to repay those who helped him, knowing that education was one of the factors that led to a better life for him. He paid it forward by helping to provide educational opportunities for others. He focused on the well-being of students and much of his administrative work was intended to support student growth and development. This included securing resources to improve and build university facilities, as Dr. Nunez mentioned, um, to build uh, the facilities, to develop grounds, and recruiting top faculty and students from around the world. He took great pride in bringing international students into the university. For dad, education led to a life beyond his expectations. In the aftermath of the fire, 
he could scarcely have imagined that he would lead an institution like ECSU or become chancellor of the Connecticut State University system. By God's grace, with education and hard work, he was able to ascend to these roles. And now, because of dad, education continues to lead others to enjoy life, lives far beyond their expectations. So proud of you, Dad. We only wish you could have been here to see it. in that very fitting tribute uh, to, your, to your dad. Uh, for those of us who thought we knew him, uh, I think after Jessica's remarks, uh, I'm sure we can all feel that we know him uh, a bit more uh, and, and more warmly and more personal. Uh, so thank you so much for, for sharing that. Uh, it's about the students. It has always been about the students, is what Dr. Carter always said. Uh, and when we were arranging the program, the family certainly uh, impressed upon me that students should be included uh, in the program in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and so uh, we have one of our student uh, organizations, uh, the United Voices of Praise, uh, to come and give us a musical selection. And so, United Voices of Praise. And it reaches, reaches to me. In the fullness, in the fullness of your, in the power, in the power, you lift me, you lift me. Hey, I'm coming up now, you lift me. the honor to serve as co-chair of the Dr. David G. Carter Sr. Commemorative Committee. Years ago, while walking across the University of Connecticut's campus, a jittery transfer student finding her way, I happened to cross paths with a man who inquired about my major, my day, and my experience at the university. That man was Dr. Carter who at the time served as an education administrator at UConn. Little did I know that he would become such a dear, dear friend and mentor to me, or that decades later, I would have the honor and opportunity to honor that kindness. The campaign to name the science building after Dr. Carter grew out of the desire to honor and recognize a man whose genius, innovative vision, inspirational spirit, and undeniable courage touched those who knew him and those who benefited from his wisdom. First, again, I'd like to recognize President Nunez for her support and the opportunity to work with her incredible staff. Dr. Stacy Close, who served as a liaison between the President's Office and our Planning Committee, our core committee, and Dr. Eunice Matthews, who with Dr. Close prepared and presented a successful case for support to Eastern's Diversity and Social Justice Committee. And now Dr. Coleman for putting together this beautiful event. Thank you. My co-chair, Connie Belton Green, who is unable to be with us today, but I know she's live streaming. Hi, Connie. Who worked closely with Dr. Carter on his executive team here at Eastern. Dwight Bachman, public relations officer at Eastern, for his tireless work 
boundless energy and commitment to this day. And public relations strategist, Anita Ford Saunders, who is with me today. There was a poem originally written by Mother Teresa that Dr. Carter loved to recite during commencement ceremonies here at Eastern, entitled, Anyway. I won't read the entire poem, just the last two verses. They read, the good you do today, people will often forget tomorrow. Do good anyway. <laughs> Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. Give the world the best you've got anyway. Dr. Carter did tremendous good and gave us his very, very best. And today, this naming ceremony acknowledges and celebrates him in a way that he and his work will forever, forever be remembered. Uh, um, I was very happy to meet David. For a long time, he was Dr. David Carter. And um, my son, who was seven, said, why is he a doctor? He works at a university. And I said, well, that's just a title. So he decided that the children could call him David, which my husband objected to. But anyway, um, that day was a wonderful day for me uh, because um, living in Willimannock, uh, I got an opportunity to know what it would be like to have someone like him eventually move to Eastern, which he did. Uh, it was the greatest day that Eastern has ever experienced. Um, I am so happy to be here on his behalf. So once he was president of Eastern, he immediately got to work. Prior to his tenure, Eastern had been somewhat of a diamond in the rough, but David saw its potential. He carefully and thoughtfully began to transform the little university in the quiet corner, as it were called, I, I still haven't figured that out, um, into a nationally organized university that it is today. So today we're here to dedicate Dr. the Science Building to Dr. Carter. As a biologist, I was personally interested in the Science Building. In fact, I wanted a brand new electron microscope laboratory. Now, most of you don't know what that is, and I don't want to take any more time because I don't have it, but those are big, and so I needed a lot of room. The original plans called for a much smaller building. I don't know if you knew that, but they did. Dr. Carter knew it was inadequate right from the start, and he lobbied hard in his inimitable way uh, in Hartford uh, to provide the more than $64 million to build that beautiful building. Finally, in 2008, we got our dream building and we were so excited. As it turned out, for me, like Moses, I never made it to the promised land. Uh, I, my career took an administrative turn, and so I, I didn't move to the new building. Of course, as you know, this was not the only building. We appreciated then, and continue to appreciate now, what Dr. Carter did for Eastern, not just for buildings, and you heard all the buildings, and, but also for the academics, and you heard that, so there's nothing more that I need to say about that. As for me, I personally witnessed Eastern's transformation, and I can say it was amazing. There were a few explosions that rattled my laboratory uh, over in the planetarium, but I, you know, I just, you know, that was a building. Did you know <laughs> that under President Carter's leadership, 15 new and renovated buildings were added to the campus footprint, doubling the university's square footage? Now, if you do the math, he was president for 18 years, 15 new buildings, that's almost a building a year. That, that's pretty impressive. Did you know that under President Carter's leadership, Eastern experience of student enrollment growth. I first met David, I think it was in 98 or 99, when he visited Sri Lanka on a recruiting mission. I had applied to a number of US colleges, and when David spoke about Eastern, 
I became intrigued. He spoke eloquently about the importance of students to think clearly and to be inquisitive, the pride he had in the faculty, and the value proposition that a liberal arts residential program provides in a student's formation. I started in the fall of 99. My first real interaction with David happened at the ACUS Gallery. Is that still around? Yes. It is, okay. I was working a catered event and running behind lugging the boxes of wine to set up the bar. As I'm trying to open these cork bottles, David walks in and sees me clearly falling behind. Without saying a word, he starts placing the bottles of wine and glasses on the table. Now picture this, I had the president of the university helping set up the event. After the event ended, I thanked him, to which he cracked a joke asking me if the meritage was any good. I did not know it then, but David had slipped into being an educator in that moment, and I learned the first of three life lessons that I carry with me. Be kind, especially to those who need it. I worked on campus while attending Eastern to help pay rent, keep the lights on, and feed myself. I can't believe I'm actually saying this, but back when Burr was an all-women's residential hall, I picked up the early morning shift to feeding everyone there. I'd walk to work every morning at 5 a.m. from Bridge Street. One morning as I was walking up Wyndham Street, David pulls up and asks me if I'd like a ride to work. I was exhausted that morning. So I hopped in, and he begins to drive. Right on cue, my stomach starts to growl. <laughs> David turns to me and asks, when did you eat last? At this point, I'm incredibly embarrassed. You see, because back then, we didn't have language such as food insecure to explain what I was experiencing. I mumbled about lunch the day before and how my break later in the morning would provide the next meal. David looks at me and says in that matter-of-fact tone, I'm taking you to breakfast. I protested, mentioning, David, the women need to be fed, and I'm going to catch holy hell if I'm late to my shift. If you knew David, you knew that he never met a no he couldn't work around, and off to the local diner. We went. So picture this, the two of us are having a full breakfast with David seated across from me, talking about the series of meetings he had later that morning, me just in awe. When we finished, David drove me to work and said he'd call and explain everything. As expected, I was admonished for being late, and no, no one believed me when I said I was at breakfast with the president because he abducted me. <laughs> True story. I was in the office when the call came in and watched the growing confusion on my, on my manager's face give way to astonishment when she realized exactly who the David on the other line was. David again was teaching me at that moment to show grace and extend that grace to others, even without being asked. The last time we spoke was also the last time I saw him. It was just prior to his inauguration, when we hosted a dinner down at Michael Purnell's. He spoke on what the chancellorship meant, and how change was the constant. And in his closing remarks, he said, remember, it's about the students. It's always been about the students. As I was clearing the kitchen that night, David stopped and shook my hand and asked me if he could help with anything. I said things were going well, and I was working on a permanent visa to remain. He smiled and told me, like he always does, don't stay out too late after work. When I got in the next day, my director pulled me aside and said David had called to ensure the company understood how important providing an avenue to immigrate to this country was to him. What he taught me at that time was the most valuable lesson of all. It's about the students. It's always been about the students. Justice Harper has asked to uh, pretty much go last. He's going to allow other uh, remarks to be provided before he gives his remarks. It is a distinct honor and pleasure for me to be here this morning, to have the opportunity to participate in this historic ceremony and to share with you a free remarks on such a special occasion regarding a brilliant, compassionate, and visionary man, my dear friend, the late Dr. David G. Carter, Sr. I'm also truly honored that Dr. Carter's children 
requested that I share with you some comments about their incredible father at this wonderful dedication ceremony. Your father loved his family and was proud of each one of you. I'm sure that you are living a life that represents the values he instilled in you. So to each one of you, I say thank you, thank you for bestowing this honor on me. Today's dedication ceremony means so much to Dr. Carter's family, colleagues and friends, especially Dwight Bachman, Eastern Public Relations Officer, who gestured to Dr. Carter in 2008 when the Science Building opened, that that building should be named after him because of his passion for science. You see, Dr. Carter was inspired by the potential of science. He understood that we are surrounded by technological and the products of science every day. He understood that students growing up in an increasingly technological and scientifically advanced world need to be scientifically literate to succeed. He wanted students prepared for that reality and wanted Eastern to play a leading role in that field. So today, Dr. Carter's passion for science will be recognized and celebrated in a grand fashion. This naming dedication ceremony is so fitting for a man who enjoyed an amazing and distinguished professional career. What began as a teaching career in Ohio public schools eventually led him to Connecticut, where he devoted his energy and talents to our university system. He joined the faculty and served in various administrative roles at UConn. Among his accomplishments, he held the distinction of being tapped as the first African-American to head a four-year institution of higher education in New England, when he was selected as the president of Eastern in 1988, where he spent 18 years. In 2006, he was selected as the first African-American chancellor of this state's well-renowned university system. During his five years as chancellor, Dr. Carter led the university system through its greatest expansion in academic program and campus development. Most important to him, though, was the growth in student enrollment, which translated into an expansion of an educational opportunities. And yet, and yet, notwithstanding those remarkable accomplishments, there is something sui generis, unique, and even eternal that will occur today when the University Science Building is named and dedicated in Dr. Carter's honor. Those of us who knew, respected, admired, and loved David will forever hold his memory and spirit in our hearts. The tribute we pay him today at this naming ceremony is different. This is a tangible expression of remembrance, a permanent and concrete expression of respect and gratitude by this university community that he held so dear. It is also fitting that this remarkable and modern science building is a monument, a monument to a man who literally helped to build and transform this campus. I knew this remarkable man for nearly four decades and enjoyed a wonderful friendship with him. I realized early on that David Carter was a special human being, a man who would make a difference, a person who would leave an indelible mark on higher education in this state and on society in general. 
I follow his illustrious and impressive career with pride. I boasted about his competence, talked about his energy and revel at how he drastically expanded and transformed the physical appearance of this campus and enhanced the academic offering and reputation of this fine institution that he always imagined to be a true beacon of liberal arts education. He knew that the physical appearance of the campus was important. It was important for it created an atmosphere that enhanced the student experience. You see, Dr. Carter was a Renaissance man, a beacon of hope, a trailblazer. He was a shining light in the hearts of so many people. He was a man of integrity who sported an infectious smile and possessed an unmatched sense of humor. He was clear about the mission of education, particularly higher education. He was a true educational leader, a skilled administrator, and a wonderful, wonderful human being. At the present, I'm semi-retired, but back in the day, I was, among other things, a member of the, the board of Connecticut State University System. I was also a very good friend of Dr. Carter and a fraternity brother. We were Masons. We were made the same day. It was such a pleasure to be here today to hear all of the things that the speakers said about him. I knew many of the things, but to hear them uh, with so many speakers saying similar things, uh, but the, the accumulation of, of things that he achieved, not just here at Eastern, but at, at the CSU system, is spectacular. But even before that, his uh, service at UConn, he was an educator's educator, and I was proud to be his friend. He was one of the most inspiring people that I ever met. I mean, seriously, there were times when he would bring me to tears. But also, a lot of people don't remember, he had a fantastic sense of humor. He loved to tell stories, they loved to laugh. So, as a human, it doesn't get much better than Dr. Carter. Dr. Carter was a 33rd degree Mason. He's one of our trusted brothers in, in, in our order. And so we came out to, to certainly celebrate this great honor of having a building here on the campus of uh, Eastern Connecticut State University named in his honor. So uh, we're just here at, to bear witness to the fact that he uh, really, really, really uh, contributed so much to our organization. And, and uh, you know, we just came as, again, as friends of uh, Dr. Carter's, you know. Uh, he's well remembered for the work that he did when he was among us here uh, as 33rd degree Masons. Well, um, for years that I've served in the legislature, I was a member of the state senate and I had a relationship with Dr. David Carter. Uh, he was uh, a presence at the legislature. He was uh, almost single-handedly championing the uh, expansion of the Eastern Connecticut State University campus. Uh, he did a lot of work with the uh, legislature's bonding commission, bonding committee, finance, revenue, and bonding committee, uh, trying to secure funding for this building on Eastern's campus, that building on Eastern's campus. Uh, he was a mentor to me and many of the other uh, African American and uh, female legislators that were a part of the General Assembly at that point in time. So he was someone uh, who can very easily be described as a mover and shaker. He was very influential uh, with the chairs of the uh, bonding subcommittee. Uh, I'd always see him in and out of their office uh, doing whatever he could to advocate for the programs uh, and particularly the construction of buildings uh, on the Eastern Campus. Uh, so he was someone who I admired, someone who I respected, someone who I looked up to. Um, can't say enough about the influence uh, and the presence of Dr. David Carter.
Uh, today we came to honor a phenomenal man, David, Dr. David Carter. He was the president of Eastern and the chancellor of all the state's um, universities. And he did a great job. And we also are alumni of Eastern. Um, I went here, um, graduated like 2004. And um, I'm very proud to have been a student here and to have known Dr. Carter. And my father also came here too when he graduated. And your Dr. Carter more than helped me out when I came to Eastern. He made me feel from this day I started Eastern um, to the end. Dr. Carter was exceptional as a friend of my family and as the president and as a good role model in my life. Dr. Carter let us give back to the community and letting us donate hours to near to the community by um, helping out the different programs out in our community and he would truly be missed and his greatness lives on. Uh, when Capital Community College came to downtown Hartford and I was appointed the uh, director of uh, or a deputy director of parking at the Hartford Parking Authority I met Dr. Carter and he uh, assisted me in becoming a member of Capital Community College's Business and Technology Advisory Council. Over the ensuing years and through his leadership and quiet guidance, we were able to develop a curriculum at CCC that allowed students with the uh, technology and computer science uh, curriculum to ascend to UConn or other four-year universities within the state because the curriculum at the community college level was identical to that at the university system. Just a wonderful man and I am so blessed for him to have put his fingerprints on my life to help me to be a better asset in the area of public service. As we work to complete the master plan, yes, I'm fortunate to be one who participates in the vision, but it was Maximilian Urban who provided the vision for the master plan. And I would like, on behalf of this community, to say to Bess, because of Max and you, we're thriving. The blueprint the dream and the future. As God has blessed Max, so should you also be blessed. Thank you, Bess, for your attendance.